This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. 90% of all the scientists who have ever lived on Earth are alive today in our generation. Scientific information is multiplying at an astonishing rate of speed. It has been computed that if a chemist or physicist sat down and read just the latest scientific journals in his one field as a full-time job, did nothing but read, at the end of a year, he would still be three months behind in his reading. Scholars are in agreement that it is impossible for any one man to know everything about anything, about any one subject on Earth. It therefore follows that nobody knows everything about the largest subject in the universe, God. But the wonder of it is that although you may not know everything about God, you can know God experientially. And that can transform human life. The anthropologist Dr. Margaret Mead has written, Science is not simply a device for explaining away events and capacities hitherto thought to be God-given. Because science expands one type of knowledge, it need not denigrate another. All great scientists have understood this. But those who hold a slavish belief in scientific facts and who do not understand the glorious uncertainties of modern science are likely to come to small conclusions. There is increasing recognition of vast unknown areas which science may explore and assist in ordering, but to which it may never provide anything like complete answers, end of quote. There are vast reaches of reality which science is simply powerless to probe. For example, many contemporary university students with whom I talk feel that science is now best able to explain those mysterious phenomena, lightning, earthquakes, etc., which were long regarded to be the wrathful intervention of deity. I can believe in a God who established natural law, one physics student told me recently, but not in a God who would break it. Yet science stands in perpetual need of the interpretive wisdom and perspective of spiritual philosophy. Wisdom is knowledge correlated with experience. For instance, by theoretical knowledge alone, you might know that water can be mixed with sulfuric acid, a fact of chemistry. But experiential wisdom discovers that the manner in which you combine the two is crucial. If you pour the water into the sulfuric acid, you may not live to learn the right way to do it, which is by pouring the sulfuric acid into the water. The first results in an explosion. The second is quite safe. Wisdom, too, involves a way in which you think what you think and do what you do. It invokes patience, inward peace, and transcendent purpose, synchronizing ultimately with the highest purpose of all, the purpose of the will of God, and reflective guidance in the accomplishing of that purpose. Contemporary science is making it increasingly difficult to maintain false concepts. For example, the photographs of a noticeably round Earth taken from near the moon by such satellites as Lunar Orbiter 1 have shaken, but not entirely shattered, the International Flat Earth Society, based in England. I confess that it really knocked me, said the Society's secretary and sole official. It was a terrible shock. But he quickly regained his composure. What the photographs show, he said, are not really the Earth at all, but probably one of the non-luminous bodies between us and the moon. This British International Flat Earth Society has 24 members. They never meet. But their secretary, a retired sign writer, occasionally publishes a leaflet. The Flat Earth Society visualizes the Earth as a plate-shaped, motionless body at the bottom of a huge pit, at the top of which the sun and the moon, which they think are about 32 miles across a piece, are whizzing about in the sky. And they quote from the scriptures to support this view of cosmology. You do not have to believe that the Earth is round if you don't want to. You can devoutly maintain that it is quite flat if you choose. Truth does not become untrue just because people refuse to believe it. God loves humankind, for instance, whether or not you happen to accept the fact. God does. Your doubting it will not alter it. But by believing it in faith, you can experience it personally. Still, this raises the question, are science and religion ultimately irreconcilable? The conflict of science with science can be more explosive than that of science with religion. I held a research fellowship with the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. I know from personal observation that two scientists working in the same field doing identical research on the same subject can disagree more vehemently with each other than either of them would disagree with a person of religious faith. The image of incompatibility, of irreconcilable enmity between science and religion has been vastly exaggerated in the public mind and in the press. 
And in many areas, there's no more conflict between science and religion than there is between science and poetry or science and history, science and music. A cello and a French horn are quite different, but are not necessarily in conflict. Playing together in an orchestra, they can create stirring harmony. So can science and religion. They are two different instruments ultimately expressing the one unified harmonious reality which is the universe. Not a multiverse, but a universe. Suppose two people are looking at the U.S. Capitol building, one viewing it through a pay telescope atop the Washington Monument, the other strolling around inside the Capitol building itself. Both are looking at the same structure, but their perspectives are enormously different. So with the perspectives of science and religion, both view reality as they perceive it, but from vastly different viewpoints. Science is not divine. Rockets go off course, computers make errors, satellites burn out, circuits get shorted, fuses blow, beakers and test tubes break. Science is by no means worthy of holy worship. But neither is it deserving of self-righteous denunciation. Science is no better than the way humanity uses it. Science at this very instant is permitting me to speak into this broadcasting microphone a teaching of love for God and love for humankind and be heard hundreds and thousands of miles distance. But this same science of broadcasting by which a person can teach love may just as effectively be utilized to teach hatred. Science is moral or immoral as humankind utilize it. If science and religion will labor together for the common good of humankind, this world will become a veritable paradise on earth. But if they work in insolent isolation, if science is unguided and unhearkening to the high ideals of religion, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, disaster will certainly result. And religion, too, is in continual need of the clear and corrective logic of science. Science harmonized with religious teaching is a great power for the good. Science without religion is a child playing with matches in a gunpowder arsenal. And the civilization of the future must realize a philosophy encompassing these truths. Just before Albert Einstein's death, the author Joseph Phillips, who knew Einstein personally, wrote of his religious beliefs, quote, although he has an unshakable faith in God, he has been assailed as an atheist. Then this author writes, of how Einstein worked. And I reiterate, this was written during Albert Einstein's lifetime. Quote, He sits back in his chair, balances a large pad on his knee, and writes in a small, neat script. When blocked by a problem, he stays with it, calm and serene, sometimes twirling a strand of hair around a finger. Each of his theories has been the result of months and years of stubbornly pursuing what he calls idealized experiments. Pencil and paper are his scientific equipment. His mind is the laboratory. He wanders up wrong alleys, draws wrong conclusions, but he never gives up. The answer is sure to be found, he feels, because, quote, God is subtle, but never mischievous. Einstein believed in the simplicity and logical orderliness of nature. Quote, it is a kind of faith that helped me through my whole life not to become hopeless in the great difficulties of investigation. When he weighs his own conclusions, the author wrote, he speculates, quoting Einstein, could this be the way God created the universe? End of quote. Science, philosophy, and religion are coordinate techniques of reality exploration. They are by no means inherently in discord. For science and religion can be superbly reconciled and unified in the experience of a philosophically thoughtful individual. A great proportion of leading scientists are also firm believers in God. And that belief is substantiated because they feel the awesome marvels they study definitely required the hand of a creator. If it is the scientist's job to describe how the universe was put together and functions, then what the scientist is doing is describing God's activities in nature, declared Dr. Donald S. Robertson, head of genetics at Ohio State University's Department of Biochemistry. Scientific laws are descriptions of how God is running the universe, he declared wrote Dr. Dwayne T. Gish, a noted biochemist who has worked with several Nobel Prize laureates. Quote, my insight into the living cell tremendously strengthened my conviction that life had to have a creator. I was able to discover the incredible complexity of living things. I saw evidence of purposefulness in every detail of the structure and function of living cells. I concluded that this vast organization demanded an organizer. 
a god, end of quote. British neurophysiologist Dr. Donald McKay noted that many of the giants of science, such as Sir Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, and others, believed in God. It is his story we are trying to tell in our own mechanistic terms, declared McKay, who was a professor at Britain's Keele University. He went on to say, quote, there's a real need to bring back a proper sense of awe into our attitude to the natural world, to marvel at the sheer wonder of its existence and not to be frightened by any sneaking feeling that religious feeling may not be scientifically respectable. And Dr. Richard Bubay, chairman of the Department of Material Science at Stanford University, wrote, I believe in the existence of God both as a consequence of an assessment of historical evidence and because of personal experience. I came into a personal encounter with this living God and believed, accepted, and established a relationship just as a person might fall in love with a woman. As the rest of my life has developed, he wrote, I've come to see and construct a rational basis in which that personal experience seems to fit better than any other. Those are the words of the chairman of the Department of Material Science at Stanford University. Or consider George Gallup, the famous authority on statistics and mathematical probabilities, who has written, quote, I could prove God statistically. Take the human body alone. The chance that all the functions of the individual would just happen by accident is a statistical monstrosity. End of quote. Consider that an expert can be trained to discriminate some 100,000 different hues and tints of color. A trained ear can detect tones ranging from 20 to 38,000 vibrations per second. The human voice with vocal cords ordinarily about one half inch long can be trained to produce 32 different scale notes. But with a string 10 times that long, a violinist can produce only 16 scale notes. The human brain contains more than 12 billion cells which form trillions of interassociations. It could not all have happened by accident. And that is a mathematical fact, says the statistician George Gallup. The great God who created this vast universe has a plan and purpose for every human life. And be you scientifically educated or uneducated, the experience of finding and knowing God is the supreme experience of human existence. And if you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation. Nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.